the only way we had of communicating with the outside world was this tiny little boat you see here. And twice a week, it used to go into Kigoma, the nearest town, 12 miles along the shore. And she played a very important role in that in those early days, although I was in a way in my dream world, the forest is very beautiful. The chimpanzees ran away as soon as they saw me. They're very conservative. They'd never seen a white ape before, and that's what I was. But when I would come down dejected in the evening, knowing that if I didn't see something exciting, the project would end, and I would have let Louis Leakey down, she would say, but Jane, think what you are learning. You're learning how they make a bed, a sleeping platform each night up in the trees. You're learning the kind of foods they eat. You're learning how they travel around in these different sized groups. You are learning a lot. Anyway, there we were. And yes, I was gradually learning. And look at this picture carefully because I'm going to come back to a rather different one later. This is how it was in 1960. The, um, the study's actually 52 years now, not 45. It's 50, we had our 50th anniversary, 1910. Uh, uh, um, it was forested like this all along. And where you see uh, the bare hills, that's because it's very rocky up there. But most places was forested with woodlands up at the top all the way along the lake for mile upon mile. It's 300 miles long. And if you climbed up to those peaks you see there, you could look away eastward from the lake and it was, it was forested, chimpanzee habitat, a few villages. And that was where I was climbing every day, uh, looking through binoculars and eventually I managed to get some money for a telescope um, searching for the chimpanzees learning about their behavior initially through my binoculars and through my telescope over some distance. And as I say, gradually acquiring information. I took a little tin trunk up there, and if the chimp slept near at night, I would sleep up there so that I could be close by in the morning. And I took a little kettle and I would boil up water for my coffee. Very simple life living very close to nature. Without any question, the happiest days of my entire life. Every night, no matter how little I'd seen, I wrote everything up. At first, I only had a, a pen and paper. Then I managed to get enough money for a typewriter. There were no laptops in those days. <laughs> they didn't exist. And every night, no matter how tired, the discipline of writing everything up. And of course, the more I got to know about the chimpanzees, the more there was to write. One day when I got down in the evening, I always climbed very early and came down uh, when it got dark, my Tanzanian cook told me that a chimpanzee had come to eat palm nuts from the tree that had ripened in my camp. He'd seen some bananas and taken them away with him. My mother had left by this time. And so, I said, well, leave some bananas out. Maybe he'll come tomorrow. I stayed down after the fourth day and immediately recognized this splendid chimpanzee male as one that I had begun to get to know in the forest, the one who had least fear and very distinctive. I mean, look at that beautiful white beard. And he was to become known as David Greybeard. And of all the chimpanzees over all 52 years, this one has the closest place in my heart. He, in a way, introduced me to his friends in the forest because it got to the stage where he would actually take a banana from my hand. And the first time he did this is another day <clears throat> I will never forget. And so because of this, if I approached a, a group of chimpanzees in the forest, maybe by mistake too close, and they're all ready to run away, but if David was in their group, they would look from him to me, and I suppose decide, well, she can't be so scary after all. And so gradually, I got to know the other chimpanzees. It was almost as though David helped me to go through a door into a magic world, the world of the wild chimpanzees. And how fortunate I was to be the first 
person to go into that world and really study the behavior of these extraordinary animals. Um, David Greybeard, you can see, over to your right is Goliath, his best friend. And then you get the old female, Flo, grooming her daughter, Fifi. I began to learn something about their complex social structure. There's a top-ranking or alpha male, and usually there's about five or six males who are ranged below him, more or less a linear dominance structure. But these males form alliances. And if you're smart, you get an ally to take your part, and then you can actually dominate a, a male who normally is higher ranking than you because you have an ally and you approach this as two against one. They're very good at these alliances. They're quite sneaky. Um, some chimpanzee males are really, really motivated to rise high in the hierarchy. Others don't seem to care as much. And the ones who get to the top and stay at the top, they're the ones who are the most intelligent. And there's a big difference. These individuals differ from each other in their personalities, just like we do. And some of them, highly motivated to get to the top, uh, may be big, tough, aggressive guys. And they get to the top by sheer physical strength. They don't last long. They last two or three years. The ones who get there by using their intelligence last much longer. And the best example I have of that is a chimpanzee called Mike. And at the time, he was ranked almost lowest of all the males, and he was past his prime. He'd already lost two, uh, two of his canine teeth, but he wanted to, to raise his status. And lying around my camp at that time, because other chimpanzees were now coming looking for bananas, there were four-gallon empty uh, cans that provided the kerosene or paraffin, whichever word you use, that I would la use for my lamp at night. And just about every male at one time or another picked up an empty can. And they do these dramatic charging displays when they're uh, challenging another male. They hurtle across the ground with bristling hair, stamping with their feet, slapping with their hands, throwing things, trying to look as big and, and, and dangerous as they possibly can, trying to intimidate, bluff the other. And just about all of them had grabbed a can because it was a, made a lovely noise when you hit it along the ground. It was a good prop for their displays. Only Mike learned to capitalize from a chance experience. He learned to keep as many as three cans ahead of him while he rushed towards a group of males, initially his superiors. And of course, they got out of the way. I mean, three, three four-gallon cans hurtling towards you. Within four months, Mike was top, and he stayed there for over six years. So they all have their different strategies for getting to the top. It's been absolutely fascinating over the years to see the relationships changing, ebbing, and flowing between the members of this 50 chimp community. Of course, I was learning about the foods they eat, mostly fruit, also stems and blossoms and almost everything you can imagine. They're omnivores like us. And sometimes they feed on insects. Um, these are catching uh, flying termites. They do hunt. They hunt for meat sometimes. I don't have a slide with me, but they do. But then just after my mother left came <clears throat> the real breakthrough observation. I can never forget the day I saw a chimpanzee. It was actually David Greybeard. This isn't David Greybeard. But David Greybeard crouched over a termite mound using a stem of grass to fish for termites, pushing it down into the hole, slowly withdrawing it, biting off the termites that were clinging with their jaws. And sometimes he would reach out and pick a twig, a leafy twig, and in order to use that as a tool, he had to strip off the leaves. That is the beginning of tool making. Why was this so exciting? Because back then, 1960, it was thought that humans and only humans used and made tools. We were known as man the toolmaker. So when I sent Lewis Leakey an excited telegram, 
he said, ah, oh, now we must redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimpanzees as humans. <laughs> Rather more importantly,